Hi, everybody, and welcome to the Open Banking Summit. I am Jörg Brandmeier, and I have the really nice task today to be your host during the next two hours. The Commerzbank made the strategic decision to focus on the topic of open banking. So it was our first step to write a white paper, and we did that with inspiring people from the Business Engineering Institute of St. Gallen. Two weeks ago, we finished, and here we are today to share our results with you. What is the aim of our event, of our summit today? We want to bring corporate customers, fintechs, and Commerzbank together. Let's find out how we can be successful in this area. But it is as it always is, good ideas, need advocates and supporters. And we are very happy to welcome a great supporter fan of open banking. He is member of the Commerzbank board and he's responsible for IT strategy and operations. Because of COVID-19, he's not here with us actually, but we broadcast live in the Commerzbank tower and say hello and welcome Jörg Hessenmüller. Thank you, Jörg, and welcome to everybody. A very good afternoon. I wish you all a fantastic Open Banking Summit. In today's world, where everything becomes digital, technology is the driving force. And technology today is shaping business models. That's why it is so important for us to understand how we will interact with each other, with our customers in the future. And in this context, one technology is of highest relevance, APIs. So why are we here today? We are here today to share our experience. Experience we have gained throughout our journey over the last quarters or even years. Experience we have gained in collaboration with our colleagues and friends from St. Gallen. Experience we have gained and which should allow not only us, all of us, to become better on behalf of our customers. Because that's what open banking is about collaboration, and collaboration is something where everybody should benefit and where everybody will benefit because this is the opportunity which technology and this new culture provides to us. Please allow me to share two insights, two views with you. The first one is around collaboration and technology. We need to collaborate together using innovative technologies in a obviously always very safe way to provide our customers with a better customer experience. I personally believe distributed ledger technology is a very good example in that respect. This only works when partners collaborate based on this new, it's not that new anymore, technology and together generate something where many can benefit from. This is how we have to interact in open banking. My second thought is around with whom do we have to collaborate to create really good use cases. We have to go across the borders of industries. We have to involve our corporate customers. We have to involve our retail customers to create use cases that go really beyond, that are really helpful. Therefore, I can only encourage each and everybody to reach out, to reach out across traditional borders. Having that in mind, I wish all of us a really great summit with a lot of insights, with a lot of fun, with good discussions, or in simple words, a really good open banking summit. Many thanks. So thank you, Jörg, and we catch up with another inspiring, supportive colleague. Give a very warm welcome with me to our Chief Technology Officer, Carsten Bittner. Carsten, hi, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. How are you? I'm very good, thank you. Carsten, Commerzbank has invested a lot of time and effort to leverage innovative technologies as big data analytics, automation, DLT and blockchain, application programming interfaces. Why do we focus so on technology? Why is it so important? So that's a great question, Jörg. And, and seriously, you're asking the CTO why technology is important. That's a great question. So I think you should know. <laughs> it. Uh, yeah, I hope so. But I mean, seriously, like many other industries, the banking industry 
is very much technology driven, obviously, right? So, and uh, we are interact, the way we interact with our customers uh, is very much depending on technology. Superior technology can create a superior customer experience. And there's also additional potential on internal operations, like to automate processes, to improve on software development, which is very important as well. And last but not least, also to reduce cost of operations. So in my opinion, the ability to create um, good customer experience, the ability to leverage latest technology is crucial for our p uh, situation in the market for customer experience, for the right products and services, and for cost-efficient and stable operations. So let's focus on the uh, open banking topic. Why is open banking with its accessible APIs of such high strategic importance for Commerzbank? How does Commerzbank live it? So API and open banking are currently changing or about to change the way we interact with customers, the way of value creation in the industry. So the way we interact with customers through APIs has changed. Some of our customers have integrated pro processes. We are directly connected with our customers and processes are running in the background, fully operated, uh, fully automated and there's ecosystems that are currently being built, there's, let's say, um, communities of interest that are being built by banks, by customers, by other organizations, they might evolve into ecosystems. And then the question is for us, which role do we want to play in ecosystems where transactions are being made through the use of APIs? And in order to answer that question, we have created an API organization about three years ago. Meanwhile, we have more than 250 operations in production and we get multi-million um, transactions every week. So this seems to be a success story for now, but it has just begun only. And even through the pandemic, we can say that API has already proven its worth because we've been able to, uh, in a very short time, create a corporate loans API that could quickly help corporate customers. So thank you for joining us so far, Carsten. I think uh, we are both excited to hear the panel discussion uh, coming up and uh, looking forward to all the exchange of ideas during the Open Banking Summit. Thank you. Yes, indeed. Thank you very much as well, Jörg. And I'm also uh, very much looking forward to the summit. I'm very much looking forward to uh, the panel discussion. And I can only encourage everyone to contribute to a vivid discussion. As you can see, we recorded this interview with Carsten on the sunny morning today. Now we are meeting Christian and Daniel. Christian Betz is research asso associate at the Business Engineering Institute of St. Gallen, and Daniel Lee is engineering in uh, Quatsch. Daniel Lee is head of strategy team of the Commerzbank I API Banking. This is the reason why we should read it from the card. It's so complicated, the names and the titles. So we meet Christian Betz, research associate of the Business Engineering Institute of St. Gallen and Daniel Lee, head of the strategy, strategy team of Commerzbank API Banking. That's, that's a hard challenge. Both are authors of our white paper and will now share some insights with you. Enjoy. Yeah. Thanks, Jörg. Hello, everyone. Two weeks ago, we published our white paper and our intention was not to teach but rather to motivate. Motivate you to pay attention to open banking and its opportunities. So that's why Christian and I, in the name of all authors, we're very happy to have all of you with us here in this Open Banking Summit. Now, let's have a closer look on two of the key messages of our white paper. First, open banking is more than just APIs. And second, value comes from beyond organizational borders. If you are a banker or if you work for 
a fintech, if you're a corporate, if you're dealing with insurances, treasury, doesn't matter. Hopefully there will be takeaways for all of you and let's get started. So let's have a look at the open banking concept first. The interest in open banking has been growing in the past with APIs being expected to be a key strategic priority over the next five years for banks. APIs, they help us to create more flexible yet resilient IT systems that can be better managed in terms of complexity as well as interconnectedness. With the right API management infrastructure at hand, we believe that we can create efficiency within the organization as well as the possibility to interact with each other across organizational borders. And the technology is really not new, but we think that we are still in the beginning of understanding what open banking actually means and what the true potential is for banks. But is it just APIs that is behind the open banking concept? The open banking concept has been discussed already from various perspectives. However, in our opinion, oftentimes too narrowly, focusing on only specific aspects while neglecting others. For us, the concept includes technical components, such as the infrastructure with an API management platform and the suitable security measures, as well as financial data of high quality, for example. On the other hand, we think that collaboration and culture are two major mindset components that are really important for open banking. That may include working practices that enable cooperation or a culture that creates creativity or fosters trust. And only when these components are combined is open banking successful and will, be s will we see new solutions, innovative ideas and ultimately create value. And we oftentimes see that banks or basically every other company should become a next platform or basically the next almighty orchestrator, just like Google, Apple or Alibaba. However, we do believe that there is a much more nuanced picture of roles and activities in such network structures. We think that banks, as well as companies, they should first of all focus on a problem. They should try to identify a real pain point and only then can banks, as well as others, think about and decide how to contribute in a specific solution, be it as a product supplier who creates certain services, be it as an aggregator who manages data or manages even whole service portfolios, or ultimately be it as an orchestrator who brings together various parties, for example, users and providers in a beneficial way and continuously enables them to interact with each other. But we have to be careful not to limit open banking to a single service domain, such as payments, nor is open banking a business model by itself. The concept enables different parties to contribute to a holistic solution where each and every one provides a specific building block. And this mix of activities is really crucial. Think about buying a car, for example. In the future, such a process will be paired with other services such as acquiring or comparing different loan options or maybe receiving a suitable insurance solution. The problem that arises right now is to bring these parties together and to integrate these services into a whole. And we believe that open banking is just a tool for doing so, be it from a technical perspective as well as from a mindset perspective. It is also important not to confuse open banking with a single strategic initiative, despite its strategic importance, as we already talked about. We think that within an organization, it is super important to identify the right know-how and to bring together experts from different domains. Additionally, it is important to open up to talk to others outside of the organization. Because first of all, we need to figure out what is actually needed out there. And second, because we need to bring the solution to life together. So for us, Open banking is really an overarching principle that must be embedded across domains, across functions, and obviously across organizations as well. And if we do this properly, we are able to create new services, holistic solutions that are bigger than the sum of their parts and ultimately to create value for clients. 
And this leads us to our second key message. Value comes from beyond organizational borders. Well, with ever more technological opportunities, we are looking at a significant shift towards more interconnectedness of organizations. For open banking, it might start with use cases such as consolidated bank accounts or streamed lending or automated accounting, new payment methods. And that's great. But does it end here? Surely not. Experts say that by 2025, around about 60 trillion US dollars of global revenues will be generated in cross-organizational networks. And I'm sure a lot of you know this number. The question is, how large is our contribution, how large is your contribution to this number going to be? Anyways, we try to show that the world is heading towards much closer collaboration and cooperation. Value is rarely being created by one organization or by one person in a garage alone. These linear value chains are breaking up and multilateral relations are on the rise, where the strengths of different parties, such as ideas, products or technologies, are being combined. And this is where we can create solutions that comprise the strengths of the crowd. However, these networks, they do come with challenges that we have to tackle together. For example, we have to make sure that technology is accessible for all parties. We have to jointly identify business opportunities and ultimately to share resources and know-how. And for this to happen, the concept that Christian was speaking about, it has to be applied in all its dimensions, sometimes even questioning beaten paths. For example, why not leverage the knowledge of your partner about what the customer really needs? Or why not try out new ways of working together, such as agile methods? And why would we want to do all of this? Because our common goal should be to generate the most accurate picture of what the customer really needs, shouldn't it? And that's why we set up agile teams across all of our head office, with thousands of employees involved. And we did that in order to be able to readjust our development according to customer centricity and a satisfying customer journey as quick as possible. Now, a few words regarding the, our API program. We've been opening up step by step. Let's have a look on two of these steps. First, our internal focus. We've been developing APIs and heavily invested into internal education with hundreds of measures. And we did that to be able to be on the same page regarding API and open banking and also in order to shift from a centralized to a decentralized and much more scaled API development. And as a result, we would have a company-wide API strategy and a clear goal of how many API operations that have to be implemented by end of 2021. And second, we've been looking out for strategic partners in order to create products or solutions that we couldn't have had on our own. And therefore, we've launched our API Premium Partner Program. And if that sounds interesting to you, please feel free to get in, get in touch with us. So all of these things that we spoke about, that might sound like a lot of change. In fact, open banking requires real change. And as Commerce Bank, we realize that there's still a long way to go. But first principles thinking, basically reinventing the wheel, is what we will have to apply to our business in many areas not only banks. However, banks and incumbent banks in particular, they will have to be starting from scratch and think about how the utility of a financial services organization is best surfaced to the customer in a real-time world. And that is at the core of the transformation that a lot of organizations might have to go through. And we know this is a big challenge because it's not only about taking technology, the technology that we spoke about, like API, DLT, or the smartphone, or you name it, and adding it into our existing business. It's also about a mental state. It's also about to be prepared to start all over again. Banks will have to be starting from scratch, and we all have to rethink our role, the role of your business, of our business, in the customer's lives, being embedded in the world around them. And that is why value comes from beyond organizational borders. That concludes our two key messages of the white paper. Again, open banking is more than just APIs, and value comes from beyond organizational borders. 
We believe there's so much more to learn in our white paper. Feel free to download and read, and also hear from our colleagues, from our interviewees, what they thought about open banking. So most importantly, please get in touch with us. Let us know what you think. Let's collaborate. Christian and I, we would love to meet some of you in the virtual networking. And thanks for your attention and enjoy the rest of the program. Many thanks to Christian and Daniel for sharing these insights with us. Thank you. And now we are talking about the differences and the challenge of successful collaboration in open banking. And for that, we welcome Leo Rosche and David Kauer. Both were interviewees of our white paper. Leo Rosche is uh, director of banking at Smava. And David Kauer is lead innovator and member of management at PostFinance in Switzerland. And we also welcome Christoph Behrensen. Christoph Behrensen is head of API banking at Commerzbank. Leo and Christoph are here with me, and Dave is joining us by video. Is that right? Hello, Dave. We're taking a second. Ah, yeah. I just get a sign that we have a little problem with the connection to Switzerland. Um, so maybe we will start with the with the talk and uh, put on board Dave when we get a connection. Sure. Sure. So let's uh, start with one very easy now, kind of kind and topic: what open banking means in general. <laughs> An easy question. So and I give it to Christoph first. Uh, Christoph, what is the, de the definition of open banking the Commerzbank have done? Actually, I think um, what is more important is what open banking means to banks. So from my perspective, there are three things that banks should do. Um, first of all, banks should acknowledge that open banking <laughs> changes the all the business cases in finance and okay. um, that, ah, there I guess Dave is. Welcome, Dave. And um, change the business cases in financial business and um, that we can't do anything against it and we don't have to do anything against it. And secondly, that this comes with a lot of possibilities for us. And thirdly, banks have to learn to get rid of the division between IT and business and let them develop together really cool stuff. So I see we have a picture. Hello, Dave. Can you hear us? Hello. Yes, I can hear you. Hello, Hello everybody from Switzerland. Yes, we got the connection. <laughs> Just COVID, uh, based, we had to connect virtually. <coughs> I apologize, but here I am. Here you are. So uh, just to get you on board in one or two sentences, we, in the first round, we had a very easy topic. What's open banking means in general? So um, that's really an easy question. And the question for you at that point is, what strategic requirements must be met within a financial institution in order to use open banking successfully? So me personally, I believe that first of all, banks should uh, clarify about their ambition level. Do they want to comply where necessary, for example, with PSD2, access to account regulations? Um, do they choose to be a follower and getting baselines done, wait and see what others do? Maybe also identifying low risk uh, use cases or what I personally would uh, recommend, uh, do they choose to be an open banking leader? And then we are talking about uh, proactive uh, corporations, uh, pilot use cases, and controlled opening of our platforms and APIs for third parties. And then what also in the beginning was mentioned, um, what is important is that the banks decide about which roles they want to play. Uh, do they want to be, for example, a TPP? Uh, do they want to work for um, their banking services? Um, uh, 
as a service um, or uh, do they want to be for example a data provider or uh, maybe also an orchestrator so all these roles are uh, possible and then of course it's uh, important to decide in which open banking frameworks uh, to participate and i also believe that the differentiation between commodity services that we would rather offer uh, multi-banking and USBs that tend to be offered only in our banks, platforms, and ecosystems in order to ship customers is crucial. So um, that's that's the point I see. Thank you. Leo, you're working for Smava, that's a fintech in our definition. <laughs> so What's your experience? How do fintechs assess how established banks will deal with technology trends? Yeah. First of all, it's also a fintech in our definition, so I'm sharing the same view here. Um, if we look in <coughs> outside in on the bank and wanting to assess how, yeah, actually how open they are for any new trends, for tech, for analytics, for data science, for APIs, um, we first look at present. So how how present they are at conferences, how present they are in the press. So are they opening any white papers like this example? Mm -hmm. Or how much is it a topic in the overall PR and outside world view for the bank? Mm -hmm. If you look in into the bank, it's more about does the bank have a dedicated team on that? Is that somehow at the right position structurally in the organization? Mm -hmm. So do you have a large team next to the CTO? So how is the overall commitment to that team? And also in terms of key personnel, right? So if you have, I don't know, if you hire outside people who are known in the tech world, that's definitely a good sign and um, something which brings a lot of trust to us that this bank is someone who is also very far in the tech world. Wow. Christoph, do we f do Commerzbank fulfill all these topics he, he pronounced? <laughs> yes, uh, of course we do. Uh, I mean, for, for us, uh, there was a big change uh, one and a half years ago when we decided to transfer to do the agile transformation. And with this, I think, uh, are coming a lot of, of those uh, aspects and uh, and sense of being a trusted partner, be open, um, be more agile, more flexible, be faster in decision making. And I think that is... Uh, everything what fintechs expect from banks, um, even though it's sometimes painful. <laughs> <laughs> I think open banking and all the things belonging there is have a lot of to do with, with um, education, with knowledgement, with uh, the same definition of things. So what is your, what are you thinking? Not every corporation partner has the necessary technical technical knowledge. Uh, how can a solution nevertheless can be developed and implemented uh, together successfully? Yeah. So from our view, there are two options. So if a bank is at the moment not really capable of doing so, we have the option to build it for banks. So this mm -hmm. is something which we don't only do at Smava. This is also a thing a lot of other fintechs do. So build it <coughs> in a white label or as a direct connection to the own system. So actually doing the tech part for the bank. Nevertheless, this is not preferred at all from us because there are a lot of things we don't know by that, um, by that procedure because we don't know if the bank will actually at some point in time be able to maintain mm -hmm. the connection. We don't know if the bank is really committed because you don't have the technical buy-in to really build everything, to really being part of the overall strategy. So um, I think if we're doing so, it's important that the bank is really doing it together with us and we're not for them because that shows them that it's part of an overall strategy, that it's part of the overall organization DNA and not just something we put next to the company and then try to collaborate with that extension. Mm. Just one uh, in between. When you, outside everyone, is watching us, can also take part in the discussion. That's what I've forgotten because we had this technical hic hiccup. Um, if you want to take part in the discussion below the streaming window, there is a tab called questions where you can send out your questions and we will get it in here actually. And we will take some time in the end of the discussion to answer the questions the audience sent to us. So uh, we will start in the second headline, corporations and partnerships with Christoph. Christoph, how does Commerzbank specifi spe specifically 
deal with partnerships actually yeah for us it's very important what's in for the business is there a business need and is there a business case and of course as always timing is really important um, for collaboration and if this is given we are very open to collaborate with fintechs with corporates with tech companies in order to create something that is really val valuable to the customer and to us. Dave, I know you have a lot of experience and um, I want to ask you, why do partnerships or close corporations fail? What could be the mistakes you can do? Yes, Christoph uh, mentioned a few points. Um, I would add uh, they can fail when no uh, common uh, value proposition can be found towards the customers, right? Or no business cases play, no commercial agreements um, suitable for both parties can be found. And that's why I believe that uh, implementing open banking, we should reduce the entry barriers and controls for these partners allowing them to establish their own business models on our platforms and ecosystems in order to can reach and optimize our um, value propositions, of course. And sure, we need controls, but we should reduce controls and um, we should be networkers as a bank and we should um, give access to, to ecosystems, to our own ecosystems and third party ecosystems. So. Uh, in fact, tomorrow uh, we will not uh, sell accounts or credit cards anymore. We will much more give access to um, ecosystems and uh, we will also do non-banking business, of course. And I think probably just to add what um, Christoph and Dave just said, that's also a requirement to the fintechs now, right? So um, as we have seen a couple of years ago, might have been enough that you that a fintech is just going out, putting a fancy name on it, some buzzwords, and just trying to sell something they're doing without really looking what's needed for the bank. Absolutely. And I think this is something what has really changed, right? So also the startups need to understand what's the value proposition they're bringing to the banks, they're bringing to the ecosystem you described, Dave. So that's a very, um, I mean, it's a kind of new requirement, but this is definitely something which has become more and more important over the last years. Mm. In the best Absolutely. case. Absolutely. Sorry, just to add, because this is too important what you just said, um, this is a perfect symbiosis between large institutions and, and small companies, as we have trust, we have the customer base, and we also have the reach, and, and you have the agility, you have different skills that we have, you have skills in software business, uh, in businesses we will never be leaders and that's why I believe that this uh, symbiosis is um, an important uh, thing we have to do uh, in order to deliver a common value proposition to our com customers. So actually here I, I have to pay a, a little different opinion because from my experience um, what fintechs are often facing is a bank that is really inflexible where it's really slow and it's complicated, the interfaces are complicated, the infrastructure is expensive. And um, from my perspective, this is something that is the real pain for fintechs and all companies who just want to collaborate. So that's why we decided to establish a partner program for API partners in order to reduce that pain. And I would just explain it as a little example. When you are a developer in a fintech, you are often facing, facing when you have a problem and you want to get an answer that you have to lock on a complicated ticket support system and wait two weeks for an answer. And we decided that our API partners get directly access to the machine room where the developers who are developing the APIs can directly answer or they can just call them. Mm. So we see Christoph uh, make some advertising. <laughs> <laughs> the the bank is really, <laughs> is really interested in a working uh, successful partnership. And the question, Leo, is in your opinion, how big is the interest of established banks corporate with fintechs? Mm -hmm. And conversely, how big is the interest of the fintech side? Are you really interested in with a big ship, with, this <laughs> with uh, all the all the topics we, you, we know when we're talking about a big company. Yeah, I mean, obviously, otherwise we wouldn't partner and um, I wouldn't sit here. So um, I think the interest of banks in fintechs has become more and more over the last years. Um, 
obviously because the fintechs have earned it in a way. So a lot of fintechs have built great success stories also to banks. So providing a real benefit, as we described before, for the business case, describing a real, real value for the core business. So um, I think fintechs have earned that attention, but it's definitely increasing over the last years. Mm. And also an interest of sharing a more important part of the overall business with the fintechs. Mm -hmm. So as described before, not only putting them on a fancy conference, putting their name on, I don't know, some innovation page and saying we're collaborating with them, but also really making business with the banks. Mm. On the other side, fintech's interest on the banks has always been there. Mm -hmm. So um, that might increase a little bit, but definitely it became more serious over the last years in the sense that the reputation to work with banks has improved very much over the last years. Mm -hmm. So what we have seen a couple of years ago is that a lot of fintechs might maybe smiled a little bit about cooperation with large banks mm -hmm. because as described before Christoph, it makes you, or it's called to make you slow, it's called to make you inflexible. But we have also seen some very, very great examples of collaboration of fintechs with banks, which increase the reputation of banks' collaboration in the fintech scene. Mm -hmm. So definitely also an increase in the interest there and also putting it in a better light, I would say, than um, years ago. Dave, Postfinance, yeah. be <laughs> honest. Did you get every fintech you want on board? No, of course not. <laughs> um, often fintechs, they come uh, to us selling uh, value propositions we already have. Yeah. Or um, they sell some magic model that is, uh, it's not possible to implement <laughs> in the market. So, of course, we don't have always a partnership, but we have an innovation lab where all the fintechs can come to us and pitch their new ideas. We have a jury, we can decide there in the innovation lab. So this is like a incubation approach, we do. And um, in the same time, um, I think what you mentioned before is also a question about governance and IT architecture. Huh? When we decide that banks do backend stuff, then we don't have the short cycles needed on the legacy systems, right? So. It's a question how to collaborate with fintechs. Maybe you do off-the-shelf solutions where the main part of the solution is not in the bank's um, IT services implemented, but in the fintech. Um, so this is all about the matter how you create um, IT architecture at the end of the day. And um, I just wanted to add that um, I believe um, that um, we have good value propositions we can deliver, but we also have to have different skills. So fintech should recommend us um, skills we don't have today. And then we can uh, do on the value chain a great job, I believe. Mm -hmm. Can you, uh, Leo, can you share with us a small secret? What is the secret of a successful uh, dealing with the clash of culture we talked about <laughs> between the small fintech and a big company? I think first you need to adopt to a certain level, obviously, to the playing rules of banks and to larger corporations. So you can't go into that corporation and change your mind every two weeks and go into a different direction all the time. So it's definitely something you have to adopt that maybe planning cycles are longer, that maybe you need to plan a little bit more in advance than before. Um, but in general, I mean, this whole cultural clash, I believe from fintech side or from startup side, is often a little bit less worse than maybe banks think. Because if you're speaking very open in the beginning and if you're sharing what's the preferred style of working, I think that is the easy part. This long-term planning, very, very forward-looking, this is definitely something Mm. We had to learn, and definitely something most of the startups have to learn. Yes, Doc. Yeah, actually, I think this is the topic of being agile and the topic of having the right culture, right? So be open, be transparent, make commitments, and not only make it, but have commitments <laughs> and fulfill them. So uh, from my perspective, it's about a common culture, a, a kind of modern culture that really differs from the old culture from banks where they were really closed and not involving fintechs um, in their business. Yeah. Mm. And maybe can I add, 
Um, banks can also uh, build up um, fintechs on their own. That's what we did with Twint, a very disruptive approach. So um, we can buy fintechs, we can collaborate with fintechs, but we can also do fully digital banks in our own environment, right? And then, of course, we will collaborate with um, these guys, with these partners, right? Um, but just to announce, we will create a fully digital bank next year, which is disruptive uh, also to our services. And of course, we will collaborate with partners and we will depend on a complete independent core system with this fintech approach, right? So that's what I mentioned before. We will be very fast on the market because it's not into our system environment integrated. It has not the same regulations um, as in a bank environment. So it's all about governance, the speed we get on the market. That's, that's what I want to say. So we can do fancy stuff, but we have to be um, creative and it's not about banks against fintechs. It's much more uh, about competition probably to add also on your question in the beginning. So it's also about, so one spice of the secret sauce is definitely also to find the banks with the right commitment, right? Mm. So as you were both describing, so having a bank where it's, as I said before, part of the strategy where you have dedicated teams who are really willing to change something and also able to push something within the bank to okay. finish. And not only yeah. having it as a fancy side project mm. of one single department head and then getting killed before start. So really having it properly in the organization. So this is definitely spice okay. of the source. We've done it right yeah. today. We had the board member, we had the CTO. Absolutely. We are serious <laughs> with it. Believe us. So <laughs> 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 we're going serious forward. <laughs> Just to add what you said, banks cannot do open banking as a side project. This, this will exactly. not work. This won't work because they need digital identities for um, private and commercial customers. They need 360 uh, data sites. They need algorithms. They need artificial intelligence. They need profiles on top. They need developer portals, sandboxes, and so on. They need a clear strategy. So this is a fundamental decision and this will never be an MVP you do like ah let's do a little bit fancy open banking this is a commitment and it's a lot about culture also because um we all know this saying um culture eats strategy for breakfast and this is what i experienced the right culture and the company is crucial and the top ceo level has to commit fully to this stuff because uh, we are talking about huge invests, hundreds of millions, maybe depending on your company, but this is not side decisions you do. This is uh, baselines and I believe the companies that do not open, they will not survive tomorrow. And maybe I could add just uh, something to this because I think additionally, what you need is to decide for a strategic portfolio of APIs to avoid that there are only created uh, isolated APIs created that don't fit together. Um, so that's why we decided for a strategic API program mm -hmm. with a portfolio of a lot of APIs that will be served internally and externally. And um, without this, it's really the, the danger that you have a really cool API for one business case and nothing more. And that is really a pity. So I'm happy that I have the backing from the CTO and the COO for the API strategy here. Mm. Leo said kind of uh, there was a time and we know when big companies smiled a little bit like the fintechs and the startups. And now we have a completely change in that time, I think. And we heard it's really hashtag funky. Uh, working together, building networks and so on. But I think it's getting more and more difficult to find the right partners, to get uh, uh, partners together to build up a system which can really successful work. So the question is, more and more complex uh, networks are emerging on the market. How can a bank prepare itself to learn how to deal with it? How we can choose the right partners to be successful, earning money, um, building effort for the customers, how we can deal with it? I think Dave 
gave a good answer to that uh, at the beginning because that is the old marketing question. What market do we want to be part of and what role do we want to play in it? And if, if you have decided about this, you can then search for the right partners and not the, uh, the other way around, what is often done. Mm. Absolutely, uh, yeah, absolutely perfect. Um, this is also my opinion, um, and what I would add is that um, banks should anticipate it by becoming a network and integrate their own. So they should uh, deliver to their customers the right physical and digital ecosystem adapters and also give advice to their customers in which ecosystems to participate in. Banks should connect at the end of the day these different players on open platforms and become themselves um, disruptive by delivering access to own and third party infrastructures. So um, what I also think they, they should lift this open innovation culture because um, they won't be able to manage the complexity of the new VUCA world uh, on their own. And I really think it's a survival of the fittest the user-centered Darwinism <laughs> and uh, the fastest adopting will um, survive. So um, banks will be software companies, banks will be networkers and they will not sell um, accounts, cards and this stuff anymore. They will much more um, give access and uh, advice um, for the right ecosystems uh, towards the customers. This is my personal belief. And also probably to add on that, Dave, this is what is super interesting for the fintechs on the bank side, obviously, right? So having that access to that huge customer base, having mm -hmm. access to a large amount of capital, obviously, having that reputation, having that trust, having that PR reach. So this really being X times bigger than the fintech is, is that's, that's the biggest value add which is in there for the fintechs, right? So yeah. this and is... And the uh, other way around. I mean with cooperating with you, we of course enlarge our market reach for the consumer loans. So yep. that's really the other way around as well. Yeah. Yep. That's what we have on our side, a lot of good customers. <laughs> <laughs> I think at that point we will take a look if we have some questions from the audience. And I ask, do we have? Do we have? Ah, we have. So the first question we have is, can open banking function as a blueprint for other industries? Also, would the fact that other industries embrace the open concept have an advantage to the banking industry? <laughs> Dave, when you start laughing, you're the first answering. Yes, of course, it is a blueprint. And um, okay, I now get uh, the last word now. Um, I believe it's about an uh, open economy because for all industry, it's important to, um, to share costs, to reduce costs by uh, using um, common infrastructure. And in the same time, customers want to have access to different information much um, larger than only the company. So um, I think there is a customer value. And at the end of the day, um, this is something that is industry agnostic. Um, open banking um, is a word which is not appropriate. We should talk about open economy um, because it's key for every industry, I believe. Yeah. And maybe what you can see here is that this is the question as well for ecosystems. I mean, an ecosystem is a system where the customer don't have to leave or perform several use cases within one area of life. And he doesn't need, there's no need to log off and to log on for another system. Um, he can do everything he wants for this area of life in the same ecosystem. And that's, that's where the benefit really is. And of course, this is interesting, to, not for only for banking industry, but for all other industries as well. And what I think is that we will see more and more seamless integration of all financial services into the use cases where you don't really feel the financial tra transaction when you perform it, because it's so seamlessly integrated. Also, one thing to add, I, I believe to the question, 
if other industries will have an advantage over the banking industry. Mm. I still believe that banking is a very, very good industry for the open approach, given that everything, at least in Germany and at least for existing players, because everything which is related to banking, may it be loan, may it be bank account, mm. it's something where people value trust very high. And this is something existing brands have, right? So this <coughs> is so therefore I would say that the existing players in the market in banking are having a pretty good situation and are in a pretty good position compared to other industries. Mm. You say it's a good uh, thing for um, uh, a good uh, topic to open for the banking industry. I think to be open is not in our cultural DNA actually. So I think that's that need a little kind of change to open up uh, 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 and yeah, I'm missing the word, uh, ein Geschäftsmodell. What is the right business word? Model. Business model. A business model um, like the banking industry is. We have another question. Oh, it's a long one. Jesus Christ. Uh, what will happen to banks who follow an open bank approach if big tech companies from Silicon Valley or Asia are entering the market? For example, if Apple Pay becomes a real bank in Germany, would, in this case, the bank as an open platform lose its direct connection to the client and consequently its USP? <coughs> I hope my question is understandable. Yet, yes, yes, it is. We will do it part by part. So the first oh. one. <laughs> what will happen to banks who follow an open bank approach if big tech companies from Silicon Valley or Asia entering the market? Yeah, they are already starting to do that, right? Um, but I think it's not an option to not do open banking because mm. then you have already failed. So for us as a bank, it's important to ha to provide state-of-the-art services and to provide an added value to the customer that is more than Apple Pay can provide. For example, when I look to the security area or when I look to the uh, a transparent consent management or whatever, where the customer can decide transparency which corporate or which fintech has access to his bank account, because that is really private. Mm. Yeah, we we say this is no um, risk because the more access points our customers can use um, in order to benefit from our services, the more attractive is our service portfolio. So me personally, I don't care because nobody owns the customer interface. I just want to make a point on this. This is an arrogant um, discussion in between banks who owns the customer. Nobody owns the customer. Uh, the customer is owner of himself, right? And the customer decides which access point to use, which ecosystem in order to benefit from its service. And we should respect the customer that he has a freedom of choice, right? It's about democracy uh, in order to use services. And as Christoph perfectly mentioned, for the customer, there is a huge benefit because he can choose a platform and all the services are included. The customer effort score is reduced and the net promoter score is pushed and the customer chooses. And if you are a good company, you have good services, you don't care about access points because you know that your services are cool and um, you go into the competition and you give the, the customer a freedom of choice. This is a very important point so, for me. Yeah. So you, Dave, you and PostFinance Switzerland are not afraid losing the direct connection to the customers. That is what I hear. Absolutely not. The more we open, the more sticky they are to us. It is like a paradox, mm -hmm. but we believe that it's true. The more we open, the more we give them choice, the more they will stick to us. The more we protect our systems, the more um, customer losses uh, and revenue losses we will have. This is what we believe, that only opening is a way forward, similar to organisms. They cannot survive alone on an island, right? Uh, they are always more powerful in an ecosystem with other um, players and partners. So we believe opening up is stickiness for our customers. We will see if it's true. 
Okay, I am, I noticed we are not that cool we want to be because the next <laughs> question <laughs> is addressed to Mr. Berensen. Mr. Berensen, you mentioned the pain for fintechs to connect to the inflexible banks. Do you address this through our own fintech platform or sandbox where you guild fintechs while they integrate? Or do you feel this is an industry responsibility to be solved by applying a shared API banking infrastructure? Bayern, is there a commercial advantage in either approach? Yeah. Um, uh, first of all, to answer to the Bayern standard, I had a look into it and it seems to be very academical, so that is not the right standard for us. We uh, follow the REST approach. So we try to reduce complexity for consumers of APIs um, by reducing complexity in the API description and definition. So we try to design an API so easy that an 80-year-old, 18-year-old developer from Singapore without any banking knowledge can develop against it. And furthermore, we have an easy to use developer portal um, with a sandbox, of course, and tryout function and all the fancy stuff um, to help fintechs and corporates to connect to it. And um, a shared infrastructure, I think, that might be there in a few years for some companies who are not able to do it themselves, but we are in some parts really a market leader, and for this, this is really a must. Any add-ons? Nope. No. Okay, I look at the time. Do we have another question? We can take one more, I think. Okay, the last one. Onboarding and partnering with fintechs is not, an own, is not only a technology problem for banks. Do you agree that banks also need to adapt their rigid risk management framework and policy to drive seamless onboarding of fintechs that want to consume bank APIs? <laughs> Definitely yeah. agree. Uh, um, sorry, Dev. Um, no, 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 go ahead. I, I definitely agree on that. Nevertheless, I haven't seen a solution for that problem, to be honest. So on how is it organizationally anchored? So how big is the team? How much is the perfect strategy? We've seen that. To really having the risk management, to having legally policy, everything that outside of one big bank, I mean, that could only go with if you build a challenger, right? So if you build now your own N26, if you build, you build your own Revolut, um, then you might be able to rethink what's in there. Otherwise, I would be super interested to see how that would go because that would make our life much easier. So mm. uh, definitely, yes, agree 100%. So I think the person who sent us this question maybe thought about it. So maybe you can get in touch. Maybe you, <laughs> can, <laughs> you can work together on that problem. <laughs> uh, we do these things like in full service providing. We do this digital onboardings also for third parties. And of course, digital onboardings for our service customers are on track. Also for customers that don't have an account with us. So I think all this um, digital identity stuff is very crucial that we get a digital identity, uh, first step in our company, second step in the country, and first step, and hopefully <laughs> it will become true um, worldwide, uh, that we can use with a single sign-on any kind of service. This will be my vision um, how we should solve it. And um, I think it's not a matter about API, it's more about governance and uh, risk. Yeah. And uh, the more risk appetite the bank has, uh, often the more um, uh, value contribution uh, contribution at market is um, implemented. So um, I tend to um, eliminate this old risk matrices <laughs> with impact likelihood and replace them with a new matrix where is a risk appetite and uh, value on the market. And the more we have of these two, the better it is the business model. Risk appetite is a difficult uh, item in these times, I think. Uh, maybe next time we invite Markus Kromek to discuss Absolutely. this topic with him. I'm sure he have a meaning uh, on that topic. 
Um, I hear from the Regie, we have more questions, a lot actually. Thank you all for taking part, um, it's great. But unfortunately, we have to move on the program uh, now. But please, please get in connect with us in the virtual network after the summit and ask uh, your questions again. A lot of people will be there to answering. It will be an interesting uh, marketplace to get in touch with each, uh, with each other. So use this possibility after the summit. Okay, in the end of that round, when I ask you, what is your meaning, what is your opinion, what is the headline for open banking in five years? How you would describe it? Who want to start? Maybe it's the final statement from everybody. Oh, to think about that statement because that's uh, really meaningful, I think. Um, I think in five years, open banking is more mature and more common and we see what we already discussed about, a connection to other industries, um, a really deep integration of a lot of financial services into several solutions for a lot of business cases, and we see a lot of ecosystems. Um, and that is where we are currently at the very beginning. We're calling Switzerland. What is your final statement? Open banking in five I years, Dave. My final statement is uh, very short. Open banking does not exist. It's about open economy and uh, banks will uh, create revenue shares, not with accounts and cards and such stuff. They will sell um, mortgages. They will um, do a lot of uh, assurance stuff and they will go into non and near banking business and become an important software player um, their own. You're really smart, Dave. You want to start a new panel discussion about open economy, right? <laughs> <laughs> we okay. have to have a topic for the next year, right? Yeah, you're yeah. right. You're right. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. I believe in five years, you will see what Dave has described in the beginning as well. You will see a clear segmentation of the banks between front runners. You will see who's a front runner, who's a follower. In the front runners, you will see much more parts of their business being part or being covered by partners from mm -hmm. the current banks. You will see those partners getting a much higher or getting much more important within the business of the banks. So this will be the identification of the front runners and the followers, they will try to limit it, to reduce it to only a small amount and try to do the majority still themselves but definitely the front runners, we will see a huge impact of APIs, of open banking, and of very close and intense partnerships. So, Christoph, that's a goal, that this network Absolutely. will be a front runner network in five years. That's a goal. Nothing to add. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing to add. So, thank you for this interesting discussion so far. Thank you, Leo and Christoph, joining me here uh, in Frankfurt. And thanks to Dave in Switzerland. Thank you. Thanks, you too. What a pleasure to me. Thank you very much. Okay, now we are heading on to Brian Pagano in the Valley. And he is Global Chief Catalyst at our partner Xway. And as a catalyst, Brian is used to think different and very happy. And we are very happy to hear his thoughts to the shape of things. So enjoy our hop uh, to the valley and Brian Pagano. Hi there. My name is Brian Pagano. I'm the chief catalyst at Axway. I'm delighted to be here to talk to you today about the shape of things. Well, what do I mean by the shape of things? First, you know the difference between stress and strain. So these two terms tend to be used interchangeably quite a bit, uh, but they're not really the same thing and the difference can be important, right? Stress is the force per, per cross-sectional area that's applied on a given object. Whereas strain is the amount of deformation that occurs to that object in, in response to that force. And so maybe another way to think about this is that the environment causes stress but we experience strain. 
And by we, I mean we as an individual person, as a team, as a department, a company, an organization experience that strain. Now, when I say environment here, I don't just mean the plants and the trees, how we usually talk about the environment. I mean the business climate that we're in, right? It's kind of an interesting year, lots of things happening in the business climate. I mean our in company's internal culture and process. I mean the physical space that we work in, right? Whether it's at the office or at home. I mean the tools we're using, the disruptions that we experience. This is the environment that's applying stress on all of us right now. So how do we respond to this stress? There are two main ways that, that we can decide to meet this challenge. Alloplastic adaptation is when we change the environment to try to meet our needs. So something's changed, we're not super happy about it, so we try to, we try to uh, change the environment back to a way that, that suits us. Whereas autoplastic adaptation is when we adapt ourselves to meet the environment. So let's take a look at these two responses, right? The first one, if we try to adapt the environment to ourselves, is kind of like pushing that rock up the hill, right? Pushing the, the boulder up the hill. It's, it's a much more difficult task. And because we're humans, right, our brains are wired in a particular way that we all, all of us, tend to fall for certain cognitive biases. One of those is the sunk cost bias. So we see this, we've all been in meetings like this, right? Where the company has some project or maybe even a program that's been going for a while, but nobody really believes in it anymore, right? Or the situation has changed enough that it's no longer so relevant, uh, but we've already invested so much. We've already done so much work, right? That's the sunk cost bias where we're trying to, even though we know that things have changed and that we should probably adapt, we're trying to still push forward because we've put so much into it. Another uh, trap that we tend to fall into is repetition compulsion. So repetition compulsion is when we tend to find ourselves doing the same action repeatedly or uh, creating the same kind of circumstances repeatedly. So if you've ever had a friend who said, you know, I'm on my 10th marriage and, you know, I, and you, you could say, well, you keep marrying the same kind of guy or the same kind of woman. So, of course, you're going to find yourself in the same kind of situation over and over again. But people do this at work, too, right? We have a project that didn't go well before, but we keep recreating that same kind of project, right? Or, you know, the person says they're never happy with their boss, but at repeated roles time and time again. It's because they're doing this repetition compulsion. Whether they know it or not, and they probably don't, they're recreating the circumstances. So why do people do this? And why do companies do this? Because it's familiar, and as humans, again, we really cling to the familiar. We love things that are familiar. Um, it's sometimes being familiar is more important to us than being correct. Now, another trap if we try to adjust the environment to us is that we start doing things that don't need to be done. What's worse is we start doing things very well that don't need to be done at all, right? And that's the worst kind of thing to be spending energy on. The worst kind of action you can take it's an action that doesn't need to be done at all. And think about the processes that your company might have, which is gold plating things that don't need to be done. Stephen Covey said every step up the wrong ladder is getting you to the wrong place faster, right? Just like there's, there's no amount of distance down a wrong road that you still shouldn't turn back because however far you go down that wrong road, you're still going to get to the wrong destination. And so it's very important that we don't do what need not be done. Now let's look at the other side. What if we adapt ourselves to the environment? I think Bruce Lee said, be like water. Uh, water shapes itself to whatever container you put it in, right? And so companies, and I work with companies all the time that say, okay, Brian, so I get it. We need to move everything to the cloud. We need to completely go from waterfall to agile. We need to completely go API first. We need to completely do these giant changes. And we all know that doesn't work. Right? That, I mean, that just never works. That's not how big companies change. What you want to look at is how could each department get 5% better? How could each process that you're doing get 5% better? Right? That's the surface area of your company. Uh, every API, every, every onboarding, right? every uh, repeated transaction. If each one of those things got 5% better, your company would be 70, 80% better suddenly without that big risk of the boil the ocean kind of big bang change that simply, simply never works. 
Now, another, another thing that happens is companies tend to look at averages versus incremental, sometimes called marginal costs, right? So the first time that you do a project or a type of project, you build an API, you make a new service, you do something, there's a learning curve. You make a lot of false steps. That first one takes longer, is more expensive. But think about this with your own exercise habits. Say you take up a new form of exercise and that first week is terrible. Your muscles are sore. You say, why am I doing this? I'm hurting myself because I'm doing the positions wrong or whatever. But what about the 10th time? The 10th workout with that exercise? What about the 10th project that your company or your organization does? It's not like the first one. You've learned how to not make as many mistakes. You are faster. It is cheaper. And so the real question is not how much does it cost us on average to do something, like to produce a new API. It's how much does each incremental one cost us after the first, say, 10? Because that's really the velocity. That's when the flywheel is going. That's going to tell you the measure of how successful your, your program is. Another one comes from uh, Seth Godin, this idea of the dip. Just like I was talking about, there's always a startup cost to any effort. And then there's always that dip where the, the incremental improvements tend to be less and less. And then you come out of the other side of it and you've got some amount of mastery. Now in Silicon Valley, we, we say fail fast and people I've noticed around the world tend to miss that, right? We hear, when we hear in Silicon Valley say fail fast, what we mean is do a prototype, do a beta, do a market analysis or something up front and decide go or no go. And if you decide to go, you go through the dip and you come out the other side where you have enough mastery. You have sufficient mastery to say, yes, this is a good idea. We see how to adapt it. We see how to move forward. We could be a player in this market. The only place you shouldn't quit is in the dip, in the middle, right? You should either make an informed decision before you start or an informed decision after you've got enough mastery, but not somewhere in the middle. And what the, how this manifests is when I'm talking to executives, especially this year, where we've got the, the fight, flight, freeze, or faint, right? The human autonomic responses happening also at the organizational level is people are saying, well, I don't know if I want to invest here. I don't know, I don't know what I want to do here. And I keep reminding them that the outcome you're seeing is always lagging from this effort that goes in ahead of time, right? So I've been exercising a lot this last week, but my weight is up a little bit. So does that mean that the exercise I'm doing this week is not effective? Not at all. I, I am sure that it's effective, but I won't be able to measure that effectiveness for another month or two months or whatever, right? My current weight is a measure of how I exercised over the last two months, not, not how I'm exercising now. And I think that's very difficult for companies to understand that the outcomes are always a lagging measure. You have to have a little bit of courage. So we know this has been a very interesting time to be in business, right? The environment is providing us plenty of stress and it is deforming us as individuals, as teams, as organizations in, in many different ways, right? And so I'll tell you, I said that there's the fight, flight, um, freeze or faint. There are a lot of good ways to respond to this stress. A, a bad one is freeze. Right. Say, well, we're just going to wait and see what happens. We're just going to, you know, kind of curl up into a ball for a year. You know, the winners and losers are being chosen now. It's not not when the dust settles quarters from now. Right. It's, it's now. Um, I understand a little bit of caution in the investing. But on the other hand, the pressure that the environment is putting on us around things like customer experience. Right. Um, that's those are things that you needed to be doing anyway. This is just accelerated a bit. So it really comes down to how you adapt, right? If you decide that, and let's be honest, most big companies I work with, and I've worked with many around the world, uh, they tend not to have focused over the previous years heavily on customer experience. But that UX, CX is probably the biggest deciding factor in today's market. And so having to adapt, meaning, okay, we have to figure out, we have to, we have to put more attention, we have to make this part of our DNA, this focus on, um, on CX, we have to change so that our business itself becomes consumable, right? We can't change that 2020 has been a fantastically interesting year. 2021 will probably be a fantastically interesting year. There's a lot of different stresses coming on us as individuals and organizations. What we can decide is how we are going to adapt to that. And so a lot of people say, okay, Brian, what, what can I do with this? 
right? assuming you agree with, with much of what I've said here, um, how can you make this actionable? Well, in all my years of technology, uh, I've never seen something as effective at making these kind of changes as APIs. Right? APIs in many ways are the, the open for business sign, the front doors of your business. The trick here is to change your business, all those hidden latent value internal systems and make your entire business consumable, right? And you do that through APIs. If you make yourself consumable, it's very easy to onboard new partners. It's very easy to have a better uh, customer experience and user experience. Same with open banking, right? There, there really is no way to do open banking without APIs, without an API program, open banking answers the call and financial services um, specifically for what APIs are doing generally for you know, retail and manufacturing and, and all the other um, industries. And, and that is how can I reduce friction, not just for my customers, but also for my employees, also for my partners, right? Nobody survives alone right now. How can I participate in ecosystems? Well, if there's a ton of friction, if there's a ton of onboarding, remember what I said about 5% improvement in each of those processes, then it's going to be difficult and partners and customers and employees are gonna vote by going somewhere else. And what we want is to reduce that friction. We want them to have a great experience. We want every part of it, the discovery, the journey, right? the onboarding, the, the building, the creating, the transactions, the success, the consumption of all this to be uh, a very frictionless, pleasant experience and that's where the focus needs to be today okay brian but how do we get started well i used to have a slide that had a picture of like the grand canyon this big chasm ge geological chasm right and i would say to people how do you cross that chasm because what you seem to be doing what most companies seem to be doing is walking slowly up to the edge and then slowly stepping off and that's not a good way to cross a chasm. That's a good way to crash into the bottom of a chasm, right? The best way to cross a chasm is to run up to it and to leap over it, to jump. And so the most important step you're going to take is the next step you take, right? That means you have to do something. You can't freeze. You can't wait and see right now. You have to take a step. Now, that probably means moving toward a more API first kind of organization. Make your business con consumable. Make your business into a consumable platform so that you can create uh, platforms, you can participate on platforms, you can be part of ecosystems. That, that's how you, you survive today, right? Um, that's the kind of change that needs to happen right now. Focus on user experience, customer experience. What are the 5% improvements you could take this week that would start to make that, get rid of the 80%, get rid of the 100%, get rid of the 200%. What's the 5% improvement you could make this week? That's your next step. And the most important step is taking that next step, is doing something to move forward because it becomes a habit for your organization. Right? You don't become a painter by talking about painting or by reading books about art. You become a painter by painting. You don't become an author or a writer by thinking or talking about writing, you become an author by writing books, right? And you don't become a customer focused company by holding committee meetings or by making you know, charters and documents. You become a customer focused company by focusing on customers, right? How can I make their lives better? How can I make this easier for them? I truly believe that open banking and powered by APIs is probably the fastest and most effective, and in some cases, the only path forward uh, for an organization today. So I hope some of that made sense. I hope it wasn't too crazy. Uh, I really enjoy doing these, these kind of talks. M my hope is that this helps uh, just put a little perspective on the environment that we're in and the world we're in, and that you have some practical next steps that you could take in uh, the coming weeks. Uh, I look forward to hearing from you. I wish I could have been there in person and uh, maybe next year. Thank you very much. Maybe next year. Thanks for this, Brian. And if you want to chat with Brian on his keynote, so please use the networking opportunity we offer later. Now we come to the final and uh, I'm happy that Christoph and Jeffan Stephanie joining me. Welcome. Uh, Christoph, you already know. And Stephanie is 
Uh, your, your full name is Stephanie Auge Dickhut, and you are the head of the Competence Center Ecosystems at the Business Engineering Institute of St. Gallen. Yes. <laughs> so, you watched from the behind the scenes, actually, Stephanie. Yes. How, how, how do you think? What do you think? How is it? Uh, I think it's an exciting summit with a lot of um, valuable thoughts about open banking, and mostly I enjoyed the panelists. They have really interesting ideas concerning the technology as an enabler of ecosystems and the need for uh, cultural transformation. So you have a lot of inspiring thoughts for the future, yes. for a good, uh, good cooperation. Great. So many thanks for your participation outside and your interest today in this Open Banking Summit. And a big thank you, of course, to all our panelists, to Carsten Bittner, to Jörg Hessenmüller, to Christian Betz and Daniel Lee uh, for sharing your ideas with us. Despite not being able to meet with us in person today, we hope that we were able to share some interesting insights and that we are able to feel the spirit we want to create in here today. We would like to take the opportunity now to share some concluding thoughts with you about the journey that brought us here and about our, our, our idea where we are heading next. And I say, Stephanie and Christoph, the stage is yours. Thank you, Jörg. Yeah, one of the ideas is that open banking is more than just payment APIs. It en enables close corporations and partnerships with corporates, with fintechs and other companies for nearly all financial services. That is what we talked about in the panel discussion today as well. The challenges that we have in the are facing in the corporations and what will it go to in what direction. And another important aspect is that open banking doesn't mean to just add another NextPass platform, but to identify jointly with, together with fintechs and corporate clients the real value or and to identify the real pain points and to create supportive solutions for this. As a bank, for example, we can offer bank services in a really secure way and with this serve an ecosystem or a solution. Clients are part of this are part of the equitation, not the solution. Solutions will be developed in a co-creation atmosphere. And in this context, personal client relationship is necessary for discussing new ideas or opportunities to create value. Among other technological possibilities, significant challenges will arise and they cannot be solved by one party on their own. As we have heard it before, we are convinced that there is a need for the parties to share their experience, their know-how and their resources to overcome these challenges. And we also see a movement or a need in the market for a higher efficiency, for example, in terms of standardization. In Switzerland, we have a market-driven demand for standardized interfaces in the financial industry. It's driven by retailers, by software providers, with the aim for closer partnership and collaboration. And exactly those partnerships are what we are pre pre preparing for. In the API banking, we are developing the necessary infrastructure for Commerzbank to collaborate with all the fintechs, corporates and other tech companies and exchange data or embed services wherever required. And as we talked in the panel discussion, this will emerge to be done across all industries during the next years. But there's something that really concerns me, and this is the lack of standardization, as you just mentioned. An API, an APIs for financial business there's current, there is currently no common definition for APIs beside PSD2 and the Berlin Group. That means that banks are not able to communicate to each other in a standardized format. 
and nobody else is able to communicate with things in a standardized format as well. And this is really crucial if we want to be, uh, if we want APIs to be the promising technology for financial business, this is really crucial for multinationals who don't want to connect every single bank with a different interface definition for exactly the same service. Or the same is for fintechs who want to just create beneficial solution for SMEs or retail clients with a seamless integration of banking services. We are convinced that open banking is an important cornerstone for engagement in ecosystems. The world is complex and solutions must be developed by taking multiple perspectives in mind. Ecosystems are a vehicle for collaboration and co-creation. It comprises a multiple or a multiple ver various purpose of different parties in combination with a shared value purpose, a goal where pa participants are working to. And with decreasing cost of communication and interaction, we will see more and more participants in these ecosystems. Obviously, there is not one big ecosystem. Companies will interact in different ecosystems in various roles. For example, they offer different services, they offer guidance to other participants in the network, or they are trying to pursue a mix of these activities. Well, now we are coming to the end, and it's on me to s say thank you. Thank you for joining us today. Thanks for your interest into that topic. I hope that you were able to take something with you today. Um, and of course, I want to thank um, Dave Kauer for being here with us on in a digital channel today. And uh, I will to thank uh, Leo Rosche for being us in uh, person here today. I really appreciate your effort. And of course, I want to thank all the team from Business Engineering Institute St. Gallen and Commerzbank who made all this possible. They have really done a great job, I think. We would also like to take the opportunity to thank you to all that supported us during the last months as interviewees. We have a lot of interesting discussion with uh, experts from a various set of companies. We talk th with them, we get feedback and valuable insights for our white paper. Thank you very much and thank you for Commerzbank that, when that we can be part of this exciting project. So when I say thank you, Stephanie and Christoph, thank you very much. And Christoph said, uh, we reached the end of our program and I would like to, to encourage you to participate now in our virtual networking space and interact with each other. Make uh, the interaction full of life uh, for the next hours. And um, how does it work? You see on the chart we're having here, you can use the QR code or you can use the link we put in there. Uh, there are several rooms where you can connect with people and ask your questions. For example, all the questions we could uh, answer in the panel discussion a Absolutely. few minutes ago. Absolutely. Or some other questions you got uh, in the last uh, time, time. So thanks a lot for joining us today. And uh, I say see you next time. Bye and stay healthy, everyone. Goodbye.